My grandfather was a fighter pilot. He flew one of the greatest fighters of all time, the F-4U Corsair. He flew throughout the Pacific in World War II. He was at Guam, Midway, and Okinawa. He was awarded all kinds of medals, including three distinguished flying crosses and 11 air medals. When I was a kid, I thought he must have won the war all by himself. My parents named me John after him, and he was my hero. And when I grew up, I wanted to be a fighter pilot, just like my grandpa. Otter 1, clear for takeoff, unrestricted climb to flight level 250, then as filed. See you guys in a couple of weeks. Otter 1, Cleveland Tower, have fun on red flag, good morning, good luck at Las Vegas. flight school, flying the most powerful fighter ever built. It's hard not to think of yourself as pretty cool, and I did. squadron went to Nellis for my first red flag. I was excited for sure, but I'll tell you, I was a little nervous about what I was getting into. Otter 1 is clear to land, runway 21 right. Looking forward to being here at red flag. Otter 1, Nellis Tower, copy gear down. Air Force Base in Nevada, 128 aircraft from six countries have assembled for the largest air combat exercises in the world. For the next 14 days, these aircraft and their crews will undertake a simulated air war. For many, it will be the final tune-up before they go into actual combat. They call it Red Flag. Your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. To our American pilots and crews, and especially to our allied partners, I'd like to be the first to welcome you to Red Flag. Nations from around the world are gathered here today, including countries from Germany with their tornadoes, Italy with their F-16. Here I was, surrounded by the Canada best fighter pilots in the world. But I think that all of us young pilots felt like we had something to prove, that we deserved to be there, and I wasn't any different. 
In fact, together, you currently represent the second largest combat air force anywhere in the world. On the first morning of Red Flag, the Nellis flight line prepares to launch an enormous international armada of aircraft, all in about 20 minutes. There are 22 F-15 Eagles, representing four American squadrons. They are considered by many to be the greatest fighter aircraft ever built. The Germans have brought eight of their European-built tornadoes. The Canadians, the multi-role F-18 Hornet arriving from Alberta and Quebec. The British Royal Navy has flown in their famous Harrier jump jets. Iron 3-1 information Alpha is current, runway 3 left. Okay, lass mir die Karte nehmen. Jawohl. Represented here are not just the best pilots and aircraft, but the finest ground crews from each country. For most personnel, this will be their first opportunity to compare themselves with other squadrons from across the United States and around the world. Eagle 2 1 on the ball. Eagle copy. It has long been known that if fighter pilots could survive their first 10 combat missions, their chances of surviving throughout their careers improves dramatically. Red Flag was created to provide those first 10 missions, and they make it as real as humanly possible. What is about to happen is considered by pilots to be more challenging and dangerous than war itself. Control operativo radio. 1, 2, 3, 4. Ok, on va refaire la vérification de la radio. 1, 2, 3. A ghostly B-2 heavy bomber floats toward the battlefield. Their job is to destroy the ground-based missile launchers before the enemy is even aware of the coming battle. A pair of stealth F-117s follow close behind. B-1s have arrived from an undisclosed distant location to provide additional bomber support if necessary. A U-2 begins its long climb to the edge of space, sending intelligence to the AWACS surveillance aircraft. On board the AWACS is Air Boss Major Rob Novotny. He will monitor the air war about to take place. 
AWACS crews use inputs from space systems and radar to understand the battle situation. Each aircraft broadcasts real-time telemetry that appears as three-dimensional imagery on board the AWACS. In this war, most of the aircraft are good guys, known as the Blue Force. The bad guys are the Red Force, or the aggressors. The bad guys fly 12 highly maneuverable F-16s. They are among the finest pilots in the United States Air Force. One is ready. Tractor is the Red Force's mission commander. For most of the pilots, Red Flag is their first taste of an air battle on a massive scale. There is no other way to prepare air crews for the real thing in all its precision, complexity, and finally, chaos. Yes, Great, and Viper's checked in as well, correct? Yeah. Talk to me about the strike package here. What are you showing? It's got the uh, Viper Platitude established in the north, right. Eagle Flight established in the south. The green guys right there, are those the Canadians? Uh, and we got Canadians or the orange guys. I thought, up the, to the, I thought north. the British were the orange guys and the green guys were the Canadians. Is that we had checked? Negative about? British or green? Canadians are orange. Okay, you're safe. Five miles out, both sides begin firing heat seeking missiles. Sniper flying. Deploy the tactical formation. Let's give them all they can handle. Flares are used to distract the inbound missiles from enemy aircraft. Chaco flight command, group bullseye 3302. Lance on top, they'll copy. As planes are hit and declared killed, they turn white on the Naxxus screen. The good guys then must disengage and return to base. The aggressors get to regenerate and return to the fight. Once the battle begins, the air boss and his team struggle to keep 128 aircraft from six countries from smashing into each other. You see it here, Viper flights northbound at 6,000. You need to get on the phone right now. Get Viper and Chaco moving, they're gonna hit. Two miles in closing, using simulated machine guns, a classic dogfight ensues. Chaco man saw threat 360 12, 10,000. Sniper one's tally two ship, off my nose. Time 
Showtime copy kill. Yeah! Chocolate 2-1, Showtime, you're dead. Red Flag is not a contest or a competition. There are no winners or losers. It is about training and saving lives. I was killed on my first mission at Red Flag. I was mad, and I had a long, lonely flight back to base to think about it. The commanders walk a very fine line. In order to save lives in real combat, they are forced to take very real risks in training. They are pushing the limits in a controlled environment. However, what I want to do is not talk about the ingress route. I, I want to talk about instead a near mid-air collision that we had up here in the EC West area. Chaco One Flight, you briefed us earlier today that you were going to maintain your route unless you deviated up here to the north. Nobody knew about it because you failed to communicate your change in flight path. As a result of that, eight people nearly lost their lives today at Red Flag. Don't let it happen again. The range restrictions for today's sortie remain unchanged. EC East, West, the 70 series ranges, you're cleared supersonic. Down My fears of screwing up single-handedly were largely unfounded. We all made mistakes, and we knew we had to fix them if we wanted to get through the next two weeks. Intentional or unintentional. In modern warfare, these pilots will have the most to fear from the ground below. Surface-to-air missiles fired from every conceivable platform have proliferated by the millions worldwide. Here we have the SA-13, and this radar is the snapshot radar. Next to, on the other side, we have They call the it the threat center. Equipped entirely with enemy weapons, it is based on the same principle used in science museums. If visitors can get their hands on the exhibits, it's a more effective learning experience. You have one that is a driving, you have a second one up at the top that operates a 90 millimeter gun. Pilots call it the petting zoo. Some guys got a big kick out of it and would go back and play around again and again. But I didn't see much value in it, at least at the time. It has a vertical range of 49,000 feet and a horizontal range of about 69,000 feet. It fires 15 rounds per minute each round weighing about 30. I don't think we appreciated the efforts of the intelligence people as much as we should have. It's not until much later when the missiles start flying around your ears and you think, I should have listened a little more when they were talking about this stuff. Now you have a, the gunner sitting in the front and the pilot behind him. The gunner is responsible for all the weapons. The only weapon that the pilot can control is the front gun. At 5 a.m. each day, they search for perhaps a single pebble blown overnight onto the runway by the desert wind. One tiny pebble that otherwise might get sucked into an aircraft's engine. It's quite possible for a crew to lose both their aircraft and their lives before even leaving the ground. miles an hour, under the radar, hugging the rocks, and at the same time you're trying to outthink and outfly the enemy. Make a mistake down low, and smack right into the rocks. That's what fighter pilots live for.
got Eagle 1 and 2 involved in this low altitude fight, is that right? Yes, sir, those are ours. Are they getting some help from the north? Yes, sir, seems like they're coming in from the north. Okay, we need to make sure you get that information in there quick. Right away, sir. Looks like he needs some help. Chaco 1 and 2, heading from the north. Chaco 2, tally 2, left 10 o'clock, 3 miles. Squadron of F-15 search enemy territory for potential targets. Tractor and his aggressors have an edge in these games. This is their playground. They have chased visiting pilots through these canyons for years. They make a formidable enemy. Sniper flight. Most kills wins. Let's go. The object is to get the enemy in front of you, while at the same time watching your backside. And then get as close as possible before being detected. front has few options. He must lose ground quickly in order to get behind the aggressor. In the blink of an eye, the hunter becomes the hunted. became less about keeping individual scores and more and more about a successful overall mission. Shooting down the bad guys is extremely important, but it's just a small part of the greater objective. If the bombs don't hit their targets, none of us has accomplished our mission. Missions become more and more challenging as Red Flag progresses. Combat periods are extended in length and intensity, and exhausted pilots are often required to refuel their aircraft simply to make it back to base. Believe it or not, sometimes the toughest part of the mission is just getting there and back. Refueling is one of the most challenging skills to master. 
It can be a serious situation if you can't take on fuel. In real combat, if you run out of gas and have to eject, you risk being captured. Four one, stabilize ready. Everyone looking for a hundred thousand pounds. There is no margin for error. If a pilot takes too long connecting with the fuel boom, he or she may endanger the lives of pilots at the end of the line. particularly hard on fighter aircraft. Engines suck in dust and even birds. Because squadrons are visiting from around the world, there are rarely spare aircraft in case of mechanical problems. Ground crews are put under intense pressure to keep their aircraft flying. Mechanics are well aware that a small error in the assembly of the engine could result in a fatal explosion, either on the test bed or in the air. There were stories that my grandfather told me as a kid that began to come back to me once I was a pilot. The machine gun that jammed. The gas tank sitting in your lap waiting to blow up. The parachutes they didn't always have time to put on. I remember he said they were more proud of the bullet holes in their aircraft than they were of their medals. They all wanted to shoot down the enemy. But I think my grandfather changed his views as he got older. He admired the young enemy pilots and their incredible bravery. I remember he spoke of them with respect. After 22 hours of hard work, an F-15's engine is readied for the next mission. At Red Flag, they seek to exceed the intensity of a combat environment, not just for the pilots, but for the mechanics and ground crews as well. It is difficult enough to turn out a perfect aircraft at the best of times. To do so in wartime, when rushed, exhausted, and under fire, is an art form like no other. Today is the halfway point at Red Flag. However, we all know that planned missions are easy ones. And this mission today is not planned. From my own personal combat experiences and those of us at the Red Flag staff, I can tell you it's the unplanned missions that are the most dangerous ones. And that's why we've added this mission to the Red Flag course. You're going to have to go further into enemy territory because lives are at stake. If all of you aren't at the top of your game, people are going to lose their lives today. Man's on Jolly One. One jumper away. Looks like we got one good shoot. Man's on after that.
Ladies and gentlemen, I've just been told that we've lost an aircraft and we have a pilot on the ground. We know his general location, however he's on the move. And the reason he's on the move is right here. The enemy is doing everything they can to capture him. They give you no warning whatsoever for this exercise. You have nothing except what you would normally carry in the aircraft's ejection seat. Water, flares, radio, and makeup. In this exercise, the commander can communicate via satellite with a downed pilot. But the pilot on the ground must remain silent in order not to give away his position. Speaking in coded language, he warns the pilot of the approaching danger from both the ground and the air. Tell your man to get down now. Knife by one. Enemy helo south of your position. Pull up now. First thing is to hope and pray that the enemy doesn't know about you in the first place. Timing is everything, because when you use the radio or flares, both sides are coming. Five, zero, six, 19, 67 vehicles running. With enemy choppers moving in to pick up the downed pilot, the air boss calls in slow flying A-10s to eliminate the helicopters. More flight, threat 270, seven enemy helos, low altitude. I wasn't completely sure if they were the good guys or not. To the search and rescue team, the man on the ground might not be a friendly at all. He could be wearing a stolen uniform and have a bomb strapped to his body. He will be treated like the enemy until he proves otherwise. I really thought the search and rescue was going to be silly. But when I saw the PJs were training in earnest, that they were fully prepared to do it for real, to risk their lives for someone they didn't even know, Thanks. I was truly humbled. All jollies, excellent work. Return to base. Advise if medics required. Throughout Red Flag, I began to appreciate the idea that I was part of a team, that everyone's role was just as important as mine. My grandfather didn't talk much about himself, but he did talk about the friends he made, ground crews, mechanics, other pilots.
one of his best friends was a Corsair pilot killed in a training accident. And I know it bothered him for the rest of his life. Throughout the history of air combat, countless air crews have successfully brought their battle-damaged aircraft home only to die on the runway a few feet and a few moments from rescue. lost friends in accidents. It's a lot safer than it used to be, but it's still a dangerous business. There are crews a red flag that you want coming in after you if you're stuck in a burning plane. People not much concerned for their own safety who will get you out of there no matter what. Go ahead. Approaching the final missions of a red flag, the dummy weapons are traded for the real thing. In a single overnight shift, hundreds of live bombs are prepared for the next day's operation. Again, there is pressure to perform as would be expected in a combat environment. They work quickly, but with great care. A slight error in a critical setting could destroy an aircraft and its crew. for the bomb builders as well. They work deep in the bottom of a canyon miles from the base in the event that something does go wrong. What I'm about to show you is the enemy's last attempt to fortify their frontline forces. We've learned that they're bringing everything forward that they can, surface to surface rockets, tanks, and anti-aircraft guns. Everything we've done to this point has been for training. Today, we're gonna to do it for real, and we're gonna give them everything that we've got. In a real war, the vast majority of flights are undertaken not by fighters and bombers, but by transport and tanker aircraft. At Red Flag, a giant C-17 using GPS navigation practices precision dropping of humanitarian supplies. Stand on, chop of light on station. Strike package inbound, picture clean. With the weapons we have today, hitting anything but the intended target is the worst thing a pilot can possibly do.
Red Flag was my first real experience to witness live ordinance. And it was sobering indeed. Chaco flight targets destroyed. Ten minutes of fuel remaining. Hands on copy. Seven or eight. And it looks like the southern target strike flight was successful with them. So we got Good everything run from them. Uh, looks like we got it all. We got it all. Yeah. Okay. Good work. And uh, the eastern and western target, no problem there. Let's bring him home. Hands up. Four one targets hit, but bingo fuel. More flight Roger. Return to base. Chopper flights return into base. Going in, I thought red flag was a chance to prove myself. Then it became all about pulling off a good mission. And there was a lot of personal satisfaction in that. But now, thinking back, what I learned at Red Flag was not just about how good I was or wasn't. It was the sense of becoming part of something more important than myself. Becoming part of a community of people with so many skills, making personal sacrifices, looking out for each other and getting the job done. I made friends with pilots and crews from all over the states and around the world. Brits, Canadians, Germans, Aussies. It was a wonderful experience and I'll remember it as long as I live. I've been lucky to have many great wingmen to watch over me. But there is one who's been with me the longest. And to me, he remains the greatest hero of them all. My grandfather said that being a fighter pilot was the best job on earth. He also said that going to war was worse than anything I could possibly imagine. I would have to say that he was right on both counts.